Isaiah 29, verses 7 and 8. I'd like to speak to you this morning on this subject. Dreams that will never come true. Dreams that will never come true. Starting with verse 7, And the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her and her munition, and that distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall even be as when an hungry man dreameth, and behold, he eateth, but he awaketh, and his soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold, he drinketh, but he awaketh, and behold, he is faint, and his soul hath appetite. So shall the multitude of the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Let's read that verse 8 again. And it shall be even as when a hungry man dreameth, and behold, he eateth, but he awaketh, and his soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold, he drinketh, but he awaketh, and behold, he is faint, and his soul hath appetite. So shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Here he said it's a very familiar thing for a man to dream that he's eating a good meal and yet when he wakes up, he's empty. And he finds it's all but an empty dream. Or if he dreams he's out on a desert in waterless places and he comes to a cool place of beautiful sparkling water and he drinks. But he said when he wakes up, he finds that he's still faint. That it's been just an empty dream. He said, just like that is the man or the nation that fights against Zion. Zion, the stronghold of the people of God. Just like that, he said, a man who fools himself with empty dreams that never come true. Like the man who fights against God or the people of God. And so we have today in ordinary experience and in observation... Many, many dreams that never, never come true. You know, there are many people today who are living in a dream world. They dream of finding happiness and true pleasure by living a Christless, godless, wicked, sinful life, a life of sin and filthy sensuality. And they live as if they believe that that's the way to get the most satisfaction out of this life. They live as if there were no heaven to gain, no hell to shun, no time and place where they must face God there to give an account of the deeds done in the body. I say they're indulging in but an empty dream as if that were the way to get most out of life. However, in the book of Proverbs, the 11th chapter, we read, As righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. And the man who lives on a low moral plane, trying to find real satisfaction out of indulgence in the things of the world and the indulgent, the baser appetites of the flesh, needs to hear again the word of God in the 10th Chapter of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Yes, many people today do not realize the truth of the Scripture as found in 1 John. The Scripture tells of the futility of the one who tries to find satisfaction and peace in indulgence in the things of the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. My friend, this old world is just as far from God today as when we studied in the lesson this morning, God saw that violence was filling the earth. 
and that the earth was corrupted before God. When God looked upon the unregenerate, sinful heart of man and saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Yes, I say conditions today are parallel to the conditions of the antediluvian time when it even repented the Lord that he had made man upon the face of the earth and decided to cut all flesh off from the earth and destroy the world under the floodwaters of divine wrath and judgment. Yet the word of God tells us, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. He says further, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In those days immediately preceding the destruction of the earth by water, we remember that the Bible says they were marrying and giving in marriage. They were buying and selling. They were seeking satisfaction in the pleasures of this earth and the acquisition of gold and silver. Buying and selling. And he said, and they knew not until the flood came and carried them all away. And so, my friends, those people who live today on the low, sensual, immoral plane are indulges, indulging in empty dreams. For we find that this world and the indulgence in the things of the world does not satisfy. For all, in verse 16 of the second chapter of First John, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. My friends, those people who seek and who believe that they can find satisfaction in indulgence of the baser sins and lusts of this life, I'd better go to some of the great wards of our large hospitals, not only in Detroit, but around the world. And there, the incurable disease wards in those hospitals demonstrate anew the fallacy of the empty dream of the man who seeks the most out of life by indulgence in sinful, worldly, sensual pleasures. In the second chapter of Ecclesiastes, we find God's word further along this line. Ecclesiastes 2, starting with verse 1, I said in my heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine. Yes, my friends, the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes had delved into every sin imaginable to man. He had drunk to, the, to his fill all the sensual pleasures of this world. And he said, it's empty, it's vain, it's profitless. Again, we read in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, verse 8, All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. He said merely the, the gratification of the physical things of this earth never can satisfy. The eye can look. And yet it's not satisfied. It's not filled with seeing. The ear can hear, but it's not satisfied with the filthy sins of which it hears. Then in verse 14, I have seen all the works that are under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. That which is wanting cannot be numbered. Who was it that spoke such words as these? This was a man who sat upon the throne of Israel, who, ro who wore his royal garments, and who had wealth beyond the imagination of men. He tells us, 
about how God had blessed him and how he had been prospered in the things of this life. Verse 12, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to me, to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. Yes, in verse 17 and 18, he sees also the empty dream of the man who would seek satisfaction not merely in the sensual, the low, the vulgar, and the vile, and the vicious things of this life, but man who would seek satisfaction in the exercise of, of the higher things of this world. In verse 17, I gave my heart to know wisdom. Well, isn't that uh, a thing to be commended? He said, not if that wisdom leaves out God. For the same writer says elsewhere, the fear of the Lord is the beginning or the greater part of wisdom. Here he said, I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. That too, I say, is in absolute contradiction to much of the philosophy of this present world who seems to think that modern-day education is the answer to the highest fulfillment of the things of this life. Now, certainly we're for the right sort of education, but sad to say many, many of the universities and institutions of higher learning today have been captured by Satan himself and their hotbeds of atheism, of agnosticism, of skepticism, and in many cases hotbeds of perversion and hotbeds of unpatriotic demonstrations over and over again. One of my fine preacher friends said to me not long ago, out of a bitter experience, he said, I'd rather a son of mine should not go to college than be subjected to much of the present day things that are taught in the secular institutions of learning. Well, my friends, in many of these institutions, they take young men from Christian homes. They take young men and young ladies from churches that are Bible-believing churches. And it seems that the chief aim of many of those faculty members is to undermine the faith of those immature young people in the Word of God, their faith in all spiritual verities. And no matter what subject they're teaching, whether of science or others, they seem to think their chief object is to undermine and to de-heart the faith of the young people in spiritual and eternal things. I say that such a faculty member, I care not how many degrees he may have behind his name, such a professor who would take the immature minds of boys and girls and slant them against the Word of God and brainwash them against the things of God and against the Lord Jesus Christ and every eternal verity of this, the holy book of God, such a person as that in the eyes of God is worse than the vilest murderer who takes human life and counts it cheap. For the person who takes human life is but cutting off a few more years of earthly existence. But the person who robs a young person of his faith actually usually makes shipwreck of the moral fiber and the moral character and the decency and integrity of that person in this life and destroys them as far as their eternal verity, uh, their eternal. The destination is concerned in heaven. All right, listen again to the words of this man who had tried all the pleasures that earth had to afford and was counting them all but vanity. Not only the vile and the sensual and the vulgar, but also he had sought satisfaction and contentment in the respectable pleasures of this world. And he says in Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, verse 22, For what hath man of all his labor, and of the vexation of his heart, 
wherein he hath labored under the sun. For all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This also is vanity. And so, my friends, the person who seeks satisfaction, not merely in sensual indulgence, but in the things of this world, whether they be riches or wisdom or knowledge, they too seek it, but in vain. For in Ecclesiastes 2, 8, I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of provinces. I get me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men and musical as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me whatsoever mine eyes desired I kept not from them I withheld not my heart from any joy for my heart rejoiced in all my labor and this was my portion in all my labor then I looked on all the works of my hands that my hands had wrought and all the labor that I had labored to do and behold all was vanity and vexation of spirit and there was no profit under the sun yes he said I have brought my silver and gold and hoarded together. But he found, as someone later said in our own day, money is a universal provider for everything but happiness. And so, my friends, this man who had spent a long life and had spent it in indulgence found out at the end of his days all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Just empty dreams, seeking satisfaction, seeking to get the most out of this life in the things of this world. But you know, there's some other people who not only dream of finding satisfaction in indulgence and in the acquisition of wealth and in the labors of their own hands, in being called great by their fellow man, in climbing to the topmost round of the ladder of fame. But there's still other people today who seem to think, and it's but an empty dream, that they can find not only peace of mind and conscience here, but they seem to think that they can find a, a home in heaven by merely going through certain religious rituals and forms and ceremonies and attending some modernistic church and going to church whenever it suits them, when it isn't inclement weather, everything else is convenient. They think that they are respectable, moral people, that they are the idols of their fellow men and that they can get by not only in this life but in the life to come just so they're respectable and religious and go to church occasionally but all the time feeling absolutely no need of Christ, no need of some salvation outside of their own provision. My friends, these people are indulging, indulging in just as empty, futile dreams as the man who would live on the lower plane of immorality and thus seek satisfaction. And yet today their name, their number is legion. Those who think that if they live good moral lives, those who think if they are church members and go to church occasionally, and are respected in their community, and make a success in life as the world would view them, they seem to think that that's the way to get the most out of their lives. But they live and they die with absolutely no realization of the sinfulness of every man outside of Christ and of the eternal destiny of every Christ rejecter. I say they ignore the pages of this Bible. This Bible, if they have it in their home, remains dust-covered and neglected. They don't search for the ways of salvation upon these sacred, holy pages. They ignore Christ. They think they can get by without Him. And my friends, their whole little empty dream is answered in the Word of God by the plain Scripture that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. That we are redeemed not with silver, gold, or corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blood, 
blemish and without spot. They seem to think that they can go on their own way, ignoring the fact that the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, ignoring the fact that every sinner outside of Christ will stand as a naked soul, uncovered at the blazing bar of God Almighty's holy judgment. They forget that the only way of salvation is provided by the grace and the mercy of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. They live in their own self-righteousness. They live in a little false world, a dream world, that their best is good enough. Their name has been legion down through the years. Last Sunday or Sunday before last, we studied in our Sunday school lesson of the dream indulged in by Cain when he brought to the fruitage of his own labor, when he brought to the product of a cursed earth and offered that to God as if his best were good enough. But you remember the word of God says that God had not respect unto Cain nor unto Cain's offering. Why? Because he thought his best was good enough. He lived in an empty dream. And so, my friend, every person today who thinks that he's good enough without the Savior, that he needs not the Lord Jesus Christ, that he doesn't need to come to a place and to an experience in life when he is a guilty sinner, falls in repentance before God and asks for grace and mercy and salvation and life eternal which can only be purchased, only be found at the foot of the cross of Christ. I say such an one. His whole life, his whole little false hope, his dream world is answered in the scriptures unmistakably where we read there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. My friend, there may be some in this great audience, doubtless there are, in this great audience of eternity bound souls who have been indulging in empty dreams. There are others who indulge themselves still further. They'll agree with the truth of the gospel. They'll agree that every soul outside of Christ is lost and will be lost eternally if he persists in his Christ's rejection and in his sin. They believe in a literal hell that awaits the impenitent who lives and dies without the Savior. They believe in a heaven that Jesus said, I go to prepare for you. They believe in the immortality of the soul, that every soul will live on and on forever, either in conscious woe in the regions and dungeons of the damned or else in conscious bliss yonder in the presence of God and the holy angel. They believe these things. They are fundamental in their belief from a head standpoint, but they are indulging in the false dream that they can go on to their own satisfaction, live without Christ until they get good and ready, and then sometime there in the future they'll turn to Christ and be saved. But my Bible says, He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. And those who are indulging in the empty, futile dream of procrastination and thinking that God runs sort of a pie counter salvation proposition, that any time they get good and ready, when they feel just exactly like it, that they can walk up to the counter and put down whatever it is and say, Now, Lord, hand me out your pie of salvation. My friends, God says, you better make my time your time. And God says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Don't presume upon the grace of God. Don't presume that he'll let you live a certain number of years of your own choosing, 50, 60, 70 years, more or less, and then you can turn to God. After indulging in your sin all your life, you can turn to God and blow the ashes of a misspent life in the very face of a sin against God. Don't live in that dream world. Don't kid yourself. Again, that scripture, I want to drive it home. He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. My friends, the soul that continually lives in sin 
And the person that continues to reject invitation after invitation finds that his power of resistance is constantly strengthened and one day he'll find that he can sit under the love of the cross under the judgment and thunders of Mount Sinai, the law of God, and still be absolutely unmoved, his soul dead. For God has said, my spirit will not always strive with man. Let him alone. Ephraim is joined to his idols. There is a time, we know not when, a place we know not where, which marks the destiny of men to glory or despair. To cross that limit is to die, to die as if by stealth. It may not dim the glowing eye nor pale the glow of health. The spirit may be light and gay, the conscience still at ease. That which pleases still may please and care be trust, thrust away. He thinks perchance that all is well and every fear is calm. He lives, he dies, he wakes in hell. Not only doomed, but damned. Oh, where is that mysterious line which may by man be crossed, beyond which God himself hath sworn that he who goes is lost? An answer from the sky repeats, Ye who from God depart, today repent. Oh, hear his voice, and harden not your heart. Yes, I say too many are living in a dream world. They think they can live and sin as they please and then come to God any time that suits them. They're living in a dream world. Hell is filled today with people who thought they could sin and then quit in plenty of time and turn to the Savior. I say that one sin of procrastination, of putting off salvation, perhaps sends more souls to hell than any other single lie that the devil confuses men to believe. 